NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory presents the Von Karman Lecture, a series of talks by scientists and engineers who are exploring our planet, our solar system, and all that lies beyond. Good evening. What a huge crowd we have tonight. You're all here for me, I assume. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for coming. Welcome to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, one of the greatest places in the world, very inspiring place full of wonderful scientists and engineers. Uh, so I thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Susan Callery. I'm the manager of the Earth Public Engagement Office, so it's my privilege to work with all of our scientists and engineers and help translate their work into uh, everyday English because some of them talk in, in uh, words we can't all understand except for the man who will be speaking to you tonight. So we've all heard a lot about drought, El Nino, uh, La Nina, uh, the, maybe even something like the Pacific Decadal Oscillation lately in the news. All of these phenomena had, have been in the news a lot lately. And, most of us do not know what they are or what they mean or what these conditions are. So we have a very special guest tonight who's going to help explain all, all of this to us, what they mean and what we can expect. Um, often he is called the prophet of California climate. Those of us at JPL also call him the king of one-liners because he has a real special ability to boil down really complex topics into a very short phrase or sentence. Um, but our speaker tonight has been a scientist at JPL since about 1983. His research is focused on improving our understanding of Earth's climate um, and in important environmental problems like El Nino and La Nina and long-term climate change. Uh, he's the author of many scientific papers, popular articles. He works with students from all of the, over the world. He gives lectures all over California and other locations. He's a huge favorite with the media. I believe he was on NBC News tonight, CBS News and CNN. He's sought out by reporters because he knows so much about weather and climate. Uh, and he also, um, in a recent article, was named one of the West's most influential individuals in dealing with water issues. He graduated from Purdue University, and then he went on to earn his PhD in oceanography at the University of Hawaii, pretty nice place to study. Uh, he began his career at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography in La Jolla and then came to JPL. During her, his career, he has served as a consultant to many organizations, including the Department of Commerce and the United Nations, as well as many other scientific organizations. He's received many awards for his scientific work, but also for communicating science to the public. We're so glad to have him with us tonight to explain what's happening in our world, Dr. Bill Patzer. Good. Thank you, Susan. Well, good evening, everybody. Can everybody hear me? OK, good. Well, welcome to JPL. You know, I hope you enjoy yourself this evening, because you paid for it, all right? We're all working for you. Now, the, uh, we have a big topic this evening. Everybody knows about the drought. We're on our knees with this drought, all right? This drought is painful. This drought has been long lasting. And what we all really want to know, when are we going to get out of this drought? And I'll try to answer that question this evening. Now, what is a drought? First of all, you know, for some people, it might be the last time you got a pay raise, you know? Or for some students, the last time you got an A. Or last time you got a tax refund. Yeah? But uh, I'm going to be talking about rain and snow, or the lack of it. That's my drought for this evening. Now, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. There is a strong connection between what happens in the Pacific Ocean and what happens to the climate, not only here in California, but across the entire planet. 
So the key is really the Pacific. When the Pacific speaks, we all should listen. And then the big question is, is that there's a lot about El Nino. El Nino is imminent, it's building. We'll take a look at it this evening. And if it matures, will it rescue us from the drought? So those are three big topics. You know, that's a lot to talk about, but uh, each one of them is a lecture in themselves, but they're so connected. I thought I'd simplify it and put all three together. Okay, now I'm gonna, don't get discouraged here, all right? <laughs> all right. This is the rainfall in Los Angeles. The average rainfall in Los Angeles is about 15 inches a year. If you're at Long Beach, it's about 10 or 12 inches a year. Up here in the San Gabriel Valley, it can be anywhere from 24 to 30 inches a year. So a lot depends on topography, a lot of microclimates. Now let's look back to 2004. That was a sweet year. That was actually the wettest year in the last 140 years. But after that, we had a lot of dry years. Now, uh, a couple of those years don't look so dry. But one of the features we have here in California, one of the ways we get rain, are these atmospheric rivers. You know, they come at us like a fire hose. A good example was that two weeks before Christmas in 2010, we had 10 inches of rain in 10 days. But it comes at you so fast and furious, those kind of events. It's like somebody aiming a fire hose at you, and you're sitting there with a champagne glass trying to catch the water. And so the way we're engineered here in Southern California, most of that ends up where? In the ocean. Oh, man, you guys are good. <laughs> All right. So let's take those atmospheric rivers out of the equation. So the bottom line is, We've had 10 really dry years in a row, if you take those atmospheric rivers, all right? Not four years, 10 years. The last four years have just been punishing. Now, this is interesting. If you take the driest four consecutive years in a row, it has to be in a row, four in a row. 2011 to 2015 was 29 inches total for the four years. So if the average is 15 a year, that means for four years, we had less than 50% of our rainfall in the last four years. Some of these other years are really interesting too, but I don't want to take too long here, all right? 47 to 51, that was a big drought period, by the way, the mid 40s to the mid 70s. And uh, a couple of guys in here will recognize 1897, you know, 1901. <laughs> All right, I'm not going to name any names, yeah? <laughs> All right, now, how can you really tell you're in a drought, all right? And, you know, I've experienced this already from my local water district, all right? If you haven't been busted yet, you will be soon because everybody has to cut back on their water, and that's a whole lecture in itself. Governor Brown, you know, I love Governor Brown. I voted for Governor Brown four times. I love the guy, all right? But he's right. We got to cut back on water. So there's my little advertisement. All right, so then let's look at the long-term climate of California. This is downtown again. It's a nice long record. It goes back to 1878. You see the average here is 15 inches a year. Some years we get less than four inches. We've had other years where there are above 30 inches. So there's a lot of variability. But if you look carefully at this chart, are there more wet years or are there more dry years? Dry years. In fact, seven out of 10 years in Los Angeles are below normal rainfall. So the next time somebody asks you, what does it look like for rainfall next year, what are you gonna say? Dry. dry, you're gonna be right seven out of 10 times. You wish you had those odds in Vegas. Yeah. All right. So in many ways, we're always in a drought in Southern California. It's a dry place, Southern California, with just episodic wet periods. Now let's look at it again a little more carefully. This is the same graph, 15 inches a year. Now from 1945 to the mid-70s, we had a lot of dry years. That was a 30-year drought, by the way. 
But if you average it, instead of 15 inches a year, it's about 13 inches a year. And this drought, which really started in 2000, I think you'll be convinced at the end of the talk, again, the same thing, about 13 inches. The 80s and the 90s were unusually wet. Those were, wet, those were good years. Those were sweet years. But you know they were about averaging about 17 inches. So the interesting thing about that, this is how precarious we are with water in California. You also get mini droughts. Remember the 87 to 92 drought? Now that was the driest five consecutive years in the historical record. Remember that's when everybody was painting their lawn green? That's when that first started, right? And that averaged for five years, only 9.5 inches. And so you get five years, you get 20 years, you get 10 years, you get 30 years, on and off, wet and dry. Now, anybody recognize what these pink things are? This is, this is if you get this one, all right, you get the prize. OK, that's a hard question. That's when Jerry Brown was governor, <laughs> all right? Now, as I mentioned, I love Jerry Brown. Yeah, I voted for him four times. Now, the first time I voted for him, he was elected into a drought in 1975. That was a bad drought. Remember, it culminated in 1977. But in his second term, in his end of his first and second term, we had some of the wettest years in the early, late 70s, early 80s. See these wet years? Those are three. So one thing you could say about Jerry Brown, he's lucky, all right? He was elected into a drought, but in his second term, he got bailed out. Now, I voted for him a third time, all right, in spite of the fact we were in a drought. I think that's why I voted for him, because he was so lucky the first time, all right, I figure he's going to get us out of this drought in his fourth term coming up. That's a joke, you guys. I'm not sure he's going to do it, all right? All right, my point is, a drought is not zero, or even half of normal. It's about 85% of average, but over a few decades. Not a few years, a few decades. That's enough to send to you your knees. So our last four years is a mini drought that's part of a longer drought. Now, this is the drought monitor. I've been looking at this for many years. It measures how intense over the continental United States, droughts are. And you can see here, the darker numbers, those are exceptional drought. We've been in an exceptional drought here for a number of years. But you notice that the entire West is in a drought. Not only that, that drought goes into Mexico and it goes into Canada, all right? So this is a long-lasting drought. But the important thing you have to remember about droughts, droughts are large. They're not local. They're large. So fires from Alaska all up through British Columbia, Pacific Northwest. By the way, Oregon and Washington are pretty severe drought, by the way. And they don't have the water infrastructure that we do. So droughts are large. Now, this is an interesting one. This is the drought monitor from a year ago. And this is this May. You notice the difference between the two charts? That serious drought in Texas and Oklahoma in the lower Midwest all of a sudden disappeared in six weeks of torrential rains in Texas. All right. So droughts end. All right. But this is something you have to remember. And this is a very famous scientist once said this, great droughts end with great floods. You know who that was? That was me. All right. <laughs> All right. And so this is when we look back in history, our great droughts tend to end in great floods. So be careful what you wish for, all right? Now this is just cool. You know, you know Picasso once said that uh, good artists borrow and great artists steal. Well, the same thing is true for PowerPoint. <laughs> I stole this one from the LA Times. but. Uh, the important thing here, this is about five years of the drought monitor from 2011, 2015. And you notice how it builds over four or five years. Okay, so what's my point? 
droughts are slow. So they're large, right? And they're slow. Now, I took the same data, this grout monitor data, and I plotted it this way. Oh, you can't see it that well for some reason. Anyhow, what it's supposed to show, the darker colors tell you how extreme the drought is. Zero means no drought. The lighter colors are moderate drought. And this goes back to 2000. So the point here was from 2000 to about 2004, we were in a building drought. Then we had a couple of years of rain. Remember 2004? Remember that was a real wet year. But then that was followed, the drought came back. And then 2010, we had a little rain. And the last four years, and so what's the point? Is, is that since 2000, we've had five dry years, two wet years. So out of the last 15 years, only two have been wet. 11 have been dry. So not only are droughts large and slow, but they wax and wane. So it's like the godfather, you know? You think you're out, and then they pull you back in. That's the way droughts are. All right. Now, let's look at something, uh, temperature. This is California winter temperature for the entire state, the average. This is December, January, and February. And this is the record. It goes back. This is to 1900. It goes up and down, all right? But if you look carefully, the average is about here. Notice there is a trend in the temperature all right, in California, winter temperature. All right. Now that's the global warming signal. So the average winter temperature for the last 115 years has increased 2.5 degrees Fahrenheit. All right. So we all know that we're living in a warming world and the, the world is melting. Sea levels are rising. But there it is in the data. And it's had a tremendous impact on something that's really very dear and important to each and every one of us. And that's the snowpack. The snow seasons come later. They leave earlier. All right? And so we're getting robbed of our winter snowpack. Now, the last two years have been unbelievable, is, is that not only was it warm, and this is mostly meteorology. But the previous record for the warmest winter was 1935. Anybody remember what that was? Well, that was the end of the Dust Bowl drought. But the last two years, it had been a full two degrees Fahrenheit above the previous record. All right. And so it's been warm. And everybody knows this. It was a warm winter. It was a warm spring, I think, except for May. And it's a scorching summer. All right, that was the dust bowl years. All right? So this drought is a scorcher. It's a hot drought, all right? It's a punishing drought. So here's the California, what I call the California snow drought. So here's average snowfall here. The green is above average. The red is below average. It goes from 1982 to 2015. And so you see we had wet periods here, the 1980s and the 90s, with the mini drought, 87 to 92, the snowpack. Since 2000, we've had a drought, wet, drought, wet. That's what I just showed you earlier, where the drought waxed and waned, right? But so hot plus dry equals puny snowpack, all right? So we're gonna re you have to remember this, 1982-83 El Nino, because we're going to talk about El Nino. Essentially, it delivered twice our normal snowpack. That was sweet, all right? And the latest big El Nino, 97-98, delivered about the same. And so one thing about El Ninos, the big El Ninos, they deliver when it comes to snowpack. All right? But this winter, something unbelievable happened. At the end of the snow season in April, there was no snow. First time it ever happened in California history. 
And usually the snowpack in the spring is 30% of our drinking water going through the summer into the fall. As it slowly melts out of the Sierra, goes into the northern reservoirs, comes down the Sacramento River, we grab it and put it in the California aqueduct, right? The MWD puts it in Lake Castaic and distributes it to each and every one of you. But that was taken off the board this summer. All right, All right let's do it again. Let's beat it to death here. Again, this is 1900 to the present. So I'm putting hot plus dry together in something called precipitation in viral transpiration index. Just think of it, this is when you put rain and heat together. Notice at the beginning of the century, 20th century, it was wet, all right? Then we hit the great dust bowl drought. And then the early 40s to the mid 40s were a very wet period. Everybody, Rody, you remember the 1941 El Nino, right? Yeah. <laughs> I remember it. That was a great El Nino, 1941. Had a big impact on World War II. But anyhow, then we went from the mid-40s to the mid-70s, where it was mostly drought, but we were in and out. The wet 80s and the 90s. And then here we are, waxing and waning since 2000. But the interesting thing here is that I have to be careful not to draw a trend on this, because it starts with a wet period and ends with a dry period. All right. But the fact is, when you look at that, you get the idea that maybe droughts are intensifying. And that's a possibility. But I'm careful not to overstate the data. But it makes sense, because the snowpack is disappearing slowly from the California Sierras. And temperatures are definitely rising. So one of the things we see here, this is Lake Oroville. This is the large, Northern California, largest man-made reservoir in the state of California. It usually, at this time of the year, you want it full of Sierra snow melt so that we can use it into the fall. It's never been this low before, all right? 28% of capacity. And this is true of reservoirs up and down the state of California, large and small. So we're definitely on reserves. One of the biggest impacts of this drought is it's been long lasting, it's been hot, and the water table in the wildlands in the Great Forest, National Forest in California, of course, have been way overgrown. There's way too many trees, but that's another story. All right. But because when the water table goes down, the trees stop producing sap, and then the bark beetles move in. So there's over 15 million dead trees in the National Forest in California. More when you go to the Rockies, more in Washington and Oregon, and it's really bad in British Columbia and Saskatchewan. So there's an awful lot of dead trees, and it's having a huge impact on the ecosystems, the natural ecosystems. And of course, the bottom line here, this is already the beginning of the worst fire season we've ever seen in the West. And remember, the fire season doesn't peak until September, October, November, December. Santa Ana season is November, December. And so this is pretty punishing and pretty costly, too. Now, did anybody see this drought coming? That's a good question, all right? Now, remember when you were a kid and you did something wrong and your mother would say, I told you so? Didn't you hate that? I always hated that when my mother said, I told you so, all right? Just remember that for a minute. OK, now, this was the front page of the Pasadena Star News. Anybody recognize that dashing old guy? <laughs> yeah? That was a little younger then, you know? Looked better. That's life, yeah? But let's see what it says here. Water shift spells drought, all right? Oceanographer says Pacific holds the key, all right? So drought, Pacific, key. Now, what was the date on that? Can anybody read that? No, it's, even I can't read it. <coughs> September 21st, 2002, okay? So essentially, I started talking about this drought in 2002. So the one thing I want to say about that is, 
Huh? All right. So the real question is, are these droughts predictable? Do I really know what I'm talking about? Maybe. All right. So why did I say that? What, you know, on what basis did I say that? You know, was that just a wild shot? Or, no, I said it because it's the PDO. Now, what's the PDO? You know, what do you mean, what's the PDO? So the question is here, this is where we move into the next phase of the talk. What's the PDO? All right. We all have a little idea of what El Nino is, what goes on in the Pacific. So I'm now I'm going to tell you about the PDO. So some really smart marine ecologist from the University of Washington looked at 100 years of sea surface temperature data in the Pacific, and they did a fancy statistical analysis of the data, essentially least square fit in time and space, and they came up with two big patterns. This is the Pacific, covers 30% of the planet. And one pattern looked like a wedge of warm water coming off the Americas, red is warm, surrounded by a blue horseshoe. It's a big pattern. It goes from the Aleutians to Antarctica, from the Americas to Asia. Then they saw a second pattern, where there was a cool wedge surrounded by a warm horseshoe. So it's really the same pattern. It's just flipped, right? It's the same pattern. So that's pretty cool. The other thing about it is, is this looks like a big El Nino, and that looks like a big La Nina. So the question is, that's cool. But how does that pattern change over time? This tells you, I, I know, I hate to do this to you. I hate these graphs. But let's look back to 1900. Blue means, when it's in the blue phase, it means it's in the cool phase, right? Or the negative phase. When it's in the red phase, like in the 80s and the 90s, it's this way. And lately, since 2000, it's mostly been in the blue phase. OK. So because most of the ocean is in the tropics, when you get the positive or the warm PDO pattern, not only warms the Pacific, it actually warms the entire Earth. All right? And when it cools the Pacific, it actually cools the entire Earth. And that's a different talk. That's the talk about the hiatus, about the warming and cooling of the global warming curve. All right? But Essentially, since 2000, we've been in a cool phase, a negative phase. All right. Back in the mid-40s to the mid-70s, remember when Jerry Brown was first elected and he was in a drought? That was a 30-year drought. We're also in a cool phase. All right. In the 80s and the 90s, when it was wet, we loved the 80s and the 90s, it was in this warm phase. And so this is a large pattern that shifts very slowly. Sometimes it sticks around for a couple of decades. All right? And so what has that got to do with the drought? So just for the fun of it, I did this once. I plotted that PDO index that you see down here at the bottom against LA rainfall. And it's not a perfect fit. But in some ways, if I know what phase of the PDO we're in, I essentially can forecast LA rainfall pretty good. And I've been doing that for years. Everybody thought I was a magician. Now you know my secret, all right? So we're in a warm phase. LA and California tend to be wet. We're in a cool phase, like the last 15 years. LA tends to be dry. Now why is that? Well, the Pacific has a huge impact depending on the temperature distribution, on the atmospheric jet stream patterns that deliver our storms every winter. So for instance, when you're in a negative phase of the PDO, you get a pattern like this. And this is, you know, all of you heard about the ridiculously resilient ridge of high pressure. There it is right there. That stuck around in the Northeast Pacific in the Gulf of Alaska for the last couple of years. And what it did, it diverted the jet stream up into Alaska, swooped down into the upper Midwest and the Northeast, left essentially the entire West Coast high and dry for the last four years, and gave all those people in Boston and Chicago just punishing winters. 
Now, when you look at the historical patterns associated with these PDOs, that's what you see. Now, I'm working on a paper on that right now to, see, to explain dynamically exactly how that happens, how heat patterns or temperature patterns in the tropics affect weather patterns in the mid-latitudes. Pretty cool, huh? And so this is your negative PDO pattern for the northern hemisphere jet stream. Pretty nice, huh? All right. Now, if you want proof of that the PDO is the real deal and just not a, a figment of my imagination, all right, look at the larger, longer impact. And my favorite is Lake Mead. Now, Lake Mead is the largest reservoir, man-made reservoir in the West. This is what it looks like. And I call Lake Mead the PDO barometer. It measures the PDO. Of course, its lake level is controlled by the PDO. So here's the lake level in going back to 1940. Remember, they started filling in 1935. All right, and, and this is where they're filling Lake Powell. So they cut off the flow to Lake Mead. But anyhow, let's look recently. Since 2000 here, the lake level in Lake Mead has dropped precipitously continuously on and off for the last 15 years. All right. So what did we say about these drought patterns? We said they were large. We said they were long lasting. So it's not just LA, it's not California. It's also the entire watershed of the Colorado River. It's the entire West. And so when LA has a drought, Lake Mead has a drought. It's on the entire Colorado watershed. So there's your 15-year drop. Now, you can't drop this in four years or five years. Lake Mead is too big. The fill time is 17 years. And so it's a great barometer for the PDO. And right now, it's never been this low in the historical record. Now, that's a problem, because seven states and five Indian nations share the water from the Colorado River. It's really important to the well-being of the West, really important. But a funny thing happened in 2000. The red curve is the average water usage. How much water did we take out of the Colorado going back to the 20s? And here's the lake level, or how much is available in Lake Mead. Now, in 2000, because everybody took their full allocation out of the Colorado, the Supply curve and the demand curve finally crossed. OK, so everybody's going to remember from e Economics 101 what happens when the supply and demand curve, all right? That means you're in deep doo-doo, all right? Demand is greater than the supply, right? And here's a quote I picked out of the newspaper. Just as the demand started to soar because of the drought, this 15-year drought began. And this is the guy from the Metropolitan Water District that manages the Colorado River water. All right. So there's another bad sign. The, over, the water from the Colorado is over-allocated. We don't have any snowpack. All right. And we haven't, definitely haven't had any good rain here for the last 15 years. So that's a drought. OK, so now the. Ring around Lake Mead. This is a mineral deposit. So anybody want to take a guess when it was this high? Remember, what were the wet decades? All right. When we were in the positive PDO and the west was wet, so this is after the El Nino winter of 1983 and the El Nino winter of 1998, Lake Mead was so full. It almost overflowed. They had to release water out of the lake. There was too much water on Lake Mead. All right. And so how did we get to the bottom? All right. As long as we stayed here in this negative PDO. And so next time you think about that ring around Lake Mead, and by the way, everybody should go see Lake Mead in Hoover Dam. Fantastic, you know? Before you die, you got to go. 
all right? Definitely take the kids. It's an amazing thing. So, but the next time you see the ring around Lake Mead, what are you gonna think? You're gonna think PDO, yeah? That lake was built to measure the PDO. Yeah. So right now it's at 35% capacity. That's really bad. Okay. So we got a little recipe for disaster here. This drought is on and off for the last 15 years. Reservoirs are low to empty. The snowpack is negligible. And the groundwater supplies here in the San Gabriel Valley in Southern California are at all times low if they're not polluted, which is about half of them. And the great aquifers that were laid down during the retreat of the Ice Age, the great aquifers in the San Joaquin Valley, and for instance, the Coachella Valley, all those golf courses, you know, that water is 10,000 years old. Nobody really knows what the reserves are, but we've been pumping it for a century. Sooner or later, you're gonna hear that sound like, you know, when you get a milkshake at In-N-Out Burger, and you get to the bottom and all of a sudden you hear <laughs> all right? Then we're really in trouble, all right? And of course, the Colorado watershed is in a large, very long-term drought. Remember, 30% of the water in Southern California comes from the Colorado River. We pump it in an aqueduct from Lake Havasu into near Hemet, Diamond Valley Lake. So 70% of the water in Southern California is imported, usually 40 from Northern and 30 from the Colorado. And they cut off the 40, and they're gonna cut off part of our 30, all right? So California, Southern California, was built on imported water. All right, so this is definitely, with the, no doubt whatsoever, this is the worst drought we've had in the past century. And this is another talk. Half of this drought was caused by, not the PDO, was caused by us. In 1950, there were only 10 million people in California, all right? Now there's 40 million. And so that's a lot more people using a lot more water. And agriculture has essentially doubled and industries that didn't exist in the 1950s are flourishing today, all right? And so, you know, California got to be the seventh largest economy in the world. It's a bigger economy than Russia or France, all right? And the limiting factor is what? Water, right? So definitely I want you to cut back on that 25%, like my buddy Jerry Brown said, all right? Okay, so now we're coming to the punchline. You got all the facts in front of you. When's the drought gonna end? Anybody know? Come on, you gotta know. Otherwise I'm gonna flunk you all. <laughs> or slip my wrists, one or the other, yeah? <laughs> one, who said it? Right. Susan, Susan is my best student, all right? <laughs> so, all right, some people think it's when the El Nino shows up. But when you're out of this drought is when the PDO flips and you get a decade of above normal rainfall because it took you a long time to get into this drought and there is no quick fix. It's gonna take you a long time to get out, all right? So you definitely better think, be thinking positive PDO, yeah? So, what happened here? This is the PDO again, right? In 2000, we went from the wet PDO, the warm PDO, to the cool PDO. And it essentially stayed there mostly for the last 15 years, on and off. All right? So what I'm thinking now, what would be really sweet, is with this big El Nino building in the Pacific, wouldn't it be nice if that big El Nino flipped the PDO from a negative to a positive, all right? That's what we're all hoping for, all right? Because until that happens, you're in the drought forever until that flips, all right? So, hold on, I got the wrong buttons. Now here's a hopeful sign. For the last 18 months, looking at the index here, the PDO has actually shifted to a positive phase, all right? Now, it could flip back, but this is a very warm, 
high PDO signal right here for the last 18 months. And so I'm pretty hopeful. Not guaranteed, but wouldn't that be sweet, all right, if we got into a long-lasting, mostly positive PDO. Of course, the other alternative, and this has been in the news lately, is that, you know, El Nino has always been billed as the great drought buster, the super El Nino, right? And so I call it the great wet hope, El Nino, right? <laughs> so what's going to happen here with the El Nino of 2015-16, all right? But even more important, I'm going to hit you with this one again. Wouldn't it be sweet if we had the big switch from the negative to the positive PDO along with that big El Nino? Okay, what is El Nino? This is as simple as I could make it. This is the tropical Pacific here. The Americas, this is Asia. When you have strong trade winds blowing from the Americas to Asia, warm water piles up here off Asia. And it cools off along the coast of the Americas. So you get very warm water piled up here, and very cool water there. The height, actually, it's almost a half a meter higher in the west during normal conditions. But when you get an El Nino, these trade winds here, they tend to weaken. And all that warm water off Asia tends to shift back across the Americas. And that's a big distance. That's a third of the circumference of the Earth, all that water sloshing back. And it moves towards the Americas. And so that's El Nino 101. Now here at JPL, you know, we've been flying a series of satellites, which I call stalking El Nino from space, all right? since 1992. One, the first one was Topex Poseidon, a joint venture with the French Space Agency, Jason 1, Jason 2, and Jason 3 we hope to launch later this year on one of Elon Musk's you know, rockets. <laughs> My fingers crossed, yeah. And what it measures is the height of the sea surface. It has a radar that bounces radar signals off the surface, measures the distance, by measuring the time. And we do it so good here. We're so good at JPL, we actually can measure that distance from 1,300 kilometers in space down to the sub-centimeter level. Now, is that cool or what? You know, are you getting your money's worth? Yeah. So stalking El Nino from space. And what I do is I produce maps of the topography of the surface of the sea surface. So <laughs> What you're going to be looking at are maps like this. And what they really are is maps of the topography of the sea surface. Some places sit higher, some places sit lower. So when there's more heat in the upper layer, the water expands. And so the ocean actually sits higher. When it cools off, it sits lower. Is that cool? That's very cool. Yeah. So it's really measuring how much heat is stored in the upper ocean, the height of the sea surface. All right. So beginning, this was, remember, we've been doing this for 23 years. So my first big El Nino was 1997. That was great. We saw in January, the El Nino started to build a series of waves from the Western Pacific moving to the Eastern Pacific. The same thing in January of this year. March, April, May, July. Now, the interesting thing is, in July, which one do you think was bigger, the 97 or the 2015? This one or this one? Come on. The 2015 is the champ. It's definitely bigger. All right, so this is a bigger event so far than what we saw in 97. And 97 was pretty exciting, all right? All right, let's see if I can do this now. OK, this is cool. OK, this is an animation side by side of the 97 event and the 2015 event, all right? And of course, it stops right now. But you can see from August through November, that 97 event really pumped up because the trade winds really relaxed. 
And so more and more heat shifted from the western into the eastern Pacific. Let's see if I can do this. I love this animation. Okay. Well, that was enough for now, okay, because we're running late. So the real question at this point is you can see by the first week in August, or this week, is that this is a stronger signal than this was at the same time in August, all right? But the real question is, does this El Nino have the staying power? Will the trade winds collapse, all right? to give us an event the size of what we saw in 1997. So that's the high drama here, all right? Now, all of you can participate in this. So the question is, is uh, Nino 2015, is it gonna be a stutter or is it gonna be a dud, all right? Will the trade winds relax from August to November? That's the high drama, all right? Or the other way to look at it is El Nino, is it gonna be a champ or a chump? Well, you can actually go to the website, clevel.jpl.nasa.gov. And every 15 days, I update that website with a new image, with a new animation, all right? And since all of you have such a big stake in this drought, all right, you know, it, it's a real simple to go to. And you can go back and play with this animation and look at all the images from the past. Now. Suppose it does deliver. What does it look like? The subtropical jet stream, which is normally brings rain into the rainforest of Guatemala and central Mexico, shifts north. And so what we get is a very wet winter across the southern tier of the United States, which is normally dry. The southeast, Texas, southern California, those are all dry places. And the polar jet stream, which was so punishing last winter, shifts to the north. In the northern tier of the United States and southern Canada get a very mild winter. And so what you see is on the news in January is mudslides in California and golfing in Minnesota. <laughs> you remember that from 97, all right? It's a big switch, all right? And it kind of looks like this. This is the pattern we saw last winter, the purple curve. And this would be the pattern we see this coming winter, December through February. But the other thing to remember about El Nino, it's global. That El Nino signal is so large that there isn't one continent on the planet that doesn't feel El Nino. You can see here it's wet across the southern tier of the US, milder winter across the northern tier, it gets very wet in places like Ecuador and Peru and Chile, which are normally dry. And the really biggest impact is all that warm water leaving the Western Pacific, they get extreme drought, Indonesia, the Philippines, Northern Australia, Southeast Asia, and it's a warmer winter, all right? And now, this is really important because two thirds of the Earth's population lives in Southeast Asia under the monsoon. Two thirds of the world's population. And so for them, the El Nino is really punishing. And we've already seen impacts. The drought has already begun in Indonesia. They've seen heavy fl flooding in Ecuador and Peru. All right. Even has impacts in Africa. South Africa tends to have a drought. The Sub-Sahel, which is normally very dry, tends to be wet. There's even a connection in Europe in the big El Ninos. Eastern Europe and Western Russia have extreme winters, extreme punishing winters. So I always like to tell this story about El Nino. Anybody remember what happened in 1812? <laughs> Come on, you gotta know some history. What happened in 1812? Why? Napoleon, all right? Napoleon marched, you know, like 400,000 troops into the heart of Russia, right? And they all froze to death. Now what happened in 1941? Same thing. You know, a second European despot, Adolf Hitler, he marched all his troops into Russia, the same thing, you know, and they all froze to death. And so the winter of 1812 and the winter of 1941, that finished off Hitler and Napoleon. 
And so some people say that Russia actually defeated Napoleon and Hitler. And, you know, that's definitely not true. It was El Nino. <laughs> OK, and let's wrap it up here, all right? All right, what can we expect if El Nino delivers? 1982-83, 97-98, 30 inches. Southern California got double its normal rainfall. OK, wouldn't that be great? Of course, it wouldn't make much difference to us, because what happens to all our rain in LA? Yeah, OK, you guys know. It all goes out into the ocean, because all the rivers are concreted. But still, it'd be nice, you know. Maybe my lawn would finally come back, but I don't think so. I think it's gone forever, right? Now, let's look at the snowpack, which is more important. Same thing, is that in those two winters, we essentially got double the snowpack in the Sierras up and down the state. Now, that would be sweet. That would definitely be sweet. So I'm excited about that. OK, so here we go. One of my theories is a really big El Nino redistributes so much heat in the Pacific, it can actually flip the PDO from a warm phase to a cool phase or a cool phase to a warm phase. And we've seen that in the past, but I didn't put that slide up. So the question is, is this big El Nino, which looks a lot like the positive PDO, all right, is it going to flip the PDO, right, to a positive phase? And remember, the drought buster is what? It's the positive phase of the PDO, not the El Nino, all right? Right. OK, so here it is. You made it to the end. All right. Now, a Godzilla El Nino would be sweet and a huge down payment on drought relief. I mean, we're pretty desperate here. Let's get right down to it, all right? We need some water. Of course, you'd have to su survive the floods and the mudslides and the havoc. Remember, the last two big El Ninos, 82, 83, 97, 98, we were not in a drought. So those El Ninos, if you were around, were never billed as drought busters. I went through the whole 97, 98 El Nino, and nobody ever asked me once, is this a drought buster? All right? Because we weren't in a drought. All right? But there were plenty of mudslides and floods and havoc. Right? But a switch to the positive PDO, which would be longer term, remember, there's no quick fix to the drought. One year is never going to get you out of this drought is really the drought buster, right? Would give us a decade or more of above normal rainfall and snowpack. And so that's really what we have our fingers crossed. Been a great audience. Thanks a lot. that one then. Anybody have any questions? Love to answer. You know, there's so much I skipped over. And I know that people have a lot of knowledge about this drought in the El Nino. Yes, sir. When you're measuring the PDO, um, are you measuring the same thing that you're measuring to track El Nino? No, that's a good question. It's an excellent question. The PDO is a sea surface temperature measurement. OK. The Satellites, my El Nino stalkers, that's a sea surface height measurement. They're complementary, but they do measure different things. Yes, sir, in the back. Me? Yes. Yes, I have a question. There was a intense rainfall throughout the year, and I think it was 2005 or 6, I can't 2004, 2005. Yes, and, now, and there was flowers in the desert and all that. Fantastic. What yeah. was the re I mean, how does that? Well, you know, when you look at how we get our rain in California, everybody makes a big deal out of El Nino. But in actual fact, over the long haul, we only get 7% of our rain from El Nino. 7%, that's all. Almost 50% comes from these atmospheric river events, these fire hose events, which are so cool, like in the December of 2010. And then if you really get lucky, you get these cool storms, you know, these cutoff lows out of the Gulf of Alaska that work their way down the spine of the Sierras. They're cold. They give you a lot of snow. If they stall off Los Angeles, it gives you four or five days of real nice rain. 
And that's what happened in 2004, 2005. All right. That's the best. All right. And of course, with this blocking high pressure that we've seen for the past few years, all those storms went north and ended up in Chicago and Boston. Good question. Yes, sir. Um, from the tenor of your talk and also from what we're getting from Governor Brown, you would get the impression that we as humans are sort of at the mercy of natural events and, and you know, victims of things like earthquakes, droughts, et cetera. But historically, that has not been true for countries that build infrastructure. And you may be aware that 50 years ago, a guy in Pasadena named Ralph Parsons proposed a plan called the North American Water and Power Alliance to bring water down from the Yukon and Alaska and distribute it throughout the southwestern states that almost passed the Senate in 1964. What would you say would be the difference today if that project had been built? Fantastic idea. If we can build a pipeline from Canada for oil, which we don't need, all right, <laughs> you know, building a couple of big water pipelines because water is one of their great natural resources, we could turn the American desert, the Mexican desert, all of the inland uh, areas in the west that are so dry, we could make them bloom, all right? The problem is Canada doesn't want to give us the water. But it's a terrific idea. You know, William Shatner talked about it a couple of months ago. But I love the water pipeline. I wrote a paper about it in 1965. Everybody ignored it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, you, you're standing there. Um, well, my question's related to some of the other questions. So you showed the graph where, where uh, the jet stream went very far north and pushed all the water uh, around the whole west coast. Yes. But I've also heard there's been, there's been drought even up in, into Alaska. Absolutely. So is there, does the water always fall somewhere or do, can, can, it, can it fall uh, on the ocean itself and not even get to land? Or is, 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 uh, the, with, with global warming, there's more moisture in the atmosphere, so you'd think there'd be a total amount of rain would keep going up. But can everybody be in a drought at no, once? It's, it's, the interesting thing, it's always the same amount of water on the planet and more or less the same amount of rain each year. The difference is who gets it. So essentially Boston, Chicago, and the East, West, and the Midwest got our rain. They got way more snow than they wanted, all right? And we didn't get any. And so what these big patterns, whether it's the PDO or the El Nino do, they redistribute all the pieces on the weatherboard. So places that are dry get wet, all right? Places that were wet for a decade or two turn into drought. And so these great decadal or semi-annual things like El Nino or La Nina, and this has been the history of civilization, is, is that, you know, in the American West, we've seen great droughts. You can see it in tree rings for centuries. And some of these PDO drought things in the 13th century, we had a drought that lasted 100 years, all right, called the mega drought. Just hope we're not in one of those. Yeah. So, so can, does Australia get more water when we get less? Absolutely. OK. Exactly. Because all the warm water's in the west. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, with the rain that, the, that Texas and those areas have gotten in this last year or so, that have helped them, quote unquote, and they're part of the drought. Have any of the aquifers been able to benefit for this for their latest drought time? I know our aquifers have been drained. But it okay, the question is, is all the heavy rains that they've had in Texas, has that improved the situation in terms of replenishing their aquifers? Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, and the answer is no. Yeah. Because most of the aquifers, there are shallow groundwater basins, like in Altadena, like in La Cañada, like in Sierra Madre, and they're relatively close to the surface. But the deep aquifers that were left, great gravel, sand, and clay deposits, they're deep, yes. a thousand feet beneath the surface. And that's water from the Pleistocene. That's not water that gets refilled when you have heavy rain for a winter, all right? And so that water is 10,000 years old. And of course, all over, the United States, as well as all over the world, these deep aquifers have been drilled primarily for agriculture, 
all right? And sooner or later, like I said earlier, we hear the big sucking sound, all right? And that's scary. It goes, it's totally unregulated in California. If you live above an aquifer, you own the aquifer. Yes, ma'am. How long do you have to wait until you know whether the PDO is flipped or not? About five years, six years. Yeah, I'll be retired by then, so. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's slow, you know? And, you know, it, you think you're in it, like I said earlier, and then all of a sudden you're out of it, you know? Or you're out, and then they pull you back in, like the Godfather, remember? Yes, sir? Um, what would the effect of building, say, a dozen or so nuclear desalination plants up the coast have on the ground? That's an excellent question. All right, there's a lot of water out there in the Pacific. And face it, that's where all the water is. It's out there in the Pacific, except it's salty. So we got to figure out how to take the salt out of it. And they have modern technology today, which can take through various filters and, and an awful lot of power, they can turn salt water into fresh water. Right now, the biggest desal plant in the Western Hemisphere is being built in Carlsbad, North San Diego County. And the cost of that, they've been building it for 10 years, the cost is a billion dollars all right, to the taxpayers. And it will take care of about 7% of San Diego County's water needs. If it works, they haven't turned it on yet. All right, all right so let's just take this thing out to its logical conclusion. We're out of water. So if the cities in California are going to have water, we're going to have to build desal plants at a billion dollars a pop. Well, I've calculated how many desal plants you would need to take care of all the urban water needs in California. The number is 200, all right? So that's $200 billion of bonds to the taxpayers, all right? And figuring out that it would take at least 20 years before any of them got an environmental impact approval, all right? <laughs> and the other thing is, is they're exceptionally energy intensive. It takes a lot of power and energy to run those desal plants. And once you desal the water, you're at sea level. And where are all the customers? All the customers are uphill, all right? So in a, what we're trying to do here is switch our economy from an oil gas economy and coal economy to a renewable energy economy, all right? And so there's a lot of negatives. On the other hand, you know, when we run out of water, you know, people get desperate and make bad decisions, right? We're definitely not all gonna get in our Priuses and go to British Columbia, all right? We're stuck here and we're gonna have to figure it out, yeah? And it's gonna be more than cutting back 25% on your home water usage. It's bigger than that. But you know, desal, I'm willing to listen to it, but it's expensive, it's power intensive, all right? So essentially, 200 plants, you'd need a plant every four miles between Tijuana and the Oregon border to supply all the urban water needs for California. Yes, ma'am. The plan that supposedly LA is working on uh, wastewater to drinking water. Great idea. <laughs> Toilet to tap. Yeah, that was the thing. Tastes better than the Colorado River water. <laughs> all right. It's definitely a great idea. They're doing it already, and they're just not telling you. All right. And we need more of it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great idea. And there's gray water. Water you use in your yard that you used in your washing machine and your dishwasher. All right, you know, this drought is in some ways, it's an economic opportunity. Cal you know, this is California, you know? This is not the third world, all right? This is an opportunity when you have something like this. We engineered our way out of all the past droughts. We built the California aqueduct, we built the Colorado aqueduct, we built dams, except now, you know, we gotta be a little more creative. And so we could become the water efficiency experts for the world, because this is not just a California problem. This is a world problem, all right? 
And so get right down to it, you know? All you young people, you know, get in the water efficiency business. The air conditioning business, too. <laughs> yes, sir. Example, which apparently is all desert, it's achieved water self sufficiency through uh, desalination and recovery of used water. I mean, exactly. Can that be scaled? Israel is an excellent example. There's two countries that really dry countries Israel and Australia. In Israel, they use 50 gallons of water per day per person. Now, I hope you're all, when you're taking your showers, you, you soak yourself down and you turn the water off. And then you soap, you know. You know, and I hope you're all letting it mellow in the toilet. You know, all that yellow, let it mellow, right? <laughs> you know, I'm like a champion. You know, I have saved, you're looking at a guy that in the last six months has saved thousands of gallons of water just letting that yellow mellow, all right? <laughs> but what's my point? In Israel, they use 50 gallons of water per day per person, all right? Australia, they use 80. The average in California is 160. Come on, we could definitely do as good as Australia, all right? And, and by the way, they have big water technology and efficiency industries in both countries, all right? But one of the things the Australians did, they centralized water management, all right? So none of this stuff where, you know, it's the Wild West here, where we've got 600 water districts, you know, and we've got laws that go back to the 19th century. You know, I got here first, it's my water. You know, Australians did away with all that, and they had centralized planning. And so you get a more equitable distribution of water. So, you know, for instance, in Australia, the farmers don't get 80% of the water. Yeah, we have two online questions. Oh, online questions. <laughs> okay. Oh, great. At Orbital Bear asks, is there a geologic evidence of El Nino prior to historical record keeping? That's a great question, and there definitely is. When we look back in tree ring records over the last couple of thousand years, we see dry years, wet years, dry decades, wet decades. And so there's no doubt that these PDO episodes and El Nino episodes have been happening for thousands of years, all right? Okay, at Be Smart asks, in the PNW region, with PN, is there a chance our aquifers might dry up, even with the help of an El Nino? Absolutely. I think I tried to get that message across. Some of these deep aquifers. My favorite one is the Coachella Valley. There's a deep aquifer there, all right? And uh, at one end of the aquifer, this is you know water that's been there thousands of years. They replenish it a little bit. Arrowhead water is pumping water out of the aquifer. That's Coca-Cola, all right? And selling it back to all you people, all right? At exorbitant fees, you know? Well, that's water, you know, the, the Indians are selling it to them on the, off the reservation. And at the other end of the aquifer, it's being pumped for 123 golf courses in Palm Springs, okay? 123 golf courses. The average rainfall is five inches a year in Palm Springs. What are they thinking, you know? All right. It's ridiculous. You know, in Palm Springs, it takes 300 million gallons of water a year for one golf course. That same golf course here in Pasadena only takes 100 million gallons of water a day, all right? So it's the most ridiculous thing I ever heard of. 103, 23 golf courses at 300 million gallons of water all this precious water that's been piling up for thousands of years, they're using it for golf courses. I mean, what's wrong with rich people, you know? <laughs> rich people are selfish. <laughs> yes, ma'am. With that ridge of high pressure up in the area you showed, if it were to shift over to a low, or, would it, or if it were to go away, would that help at all or relieve any pain? Oh, man, you know, if it switched to a low pressure system that was generating storms out of the Gulf of Alaska, making their way down the west coast, you know, I would be so happy, you know. But, and, and, and of course, that could happen if we switch to the warm phase of the PDO, 
from the cool phase. But you know, that's what we, it's a good, excellent point, because in one pattern it's a high, but in the other pattern it's a low. Yeah? So that's why you get wet decades and dry decades. Yeah? Yes, ma'am. It sounds to me like we plan, we're planning now for water scarcity, but if we're going to have that flip of the PDO, we really need to plan better for water abundance so we can capture that water at least in, in the ground in groundwater instead of having it all run off to the ocean. Could you comment on that? Well, that's a good point. If we're going to get into a wet period, we should plan better how to capture the water when it comes. And it's a good point. Now, we have actually big groundwater supplies. When the great ice sheets retreated, they left big deposits of gravel, sand, underneath Los Angeles. And so there are big groundwater supplies all the way from Long Beach to Pasadena, all the way into the Inland Empire, into San Fernando Valley, except half of them are polluted. And so you can't use them. That's really a shame. And so we're going to have to spend some money to clean those groundwater basins up and use them for storage. So during the wet years, we let the water accumulate in our local groundwater basins, and then we use it later on for the dry years. It's a big part. So in some ways, we're too reliant on imported water. If 70% is coming from Northern California and the Colorado, all right, we could actually change that to 70% being locally grown water, but we'd have to clean up the groundwater basins. Yes? I've heard that they're thinking about taking out some of the cement that's lining some of the rivers that we've artificially cemented in to assist in replenishing the aquifers. Is there a statewide plan to do that, or is it just in isolated areas? Well, that's an excellent question. Again, the LA River is concrete for 51 miles, essentially from the San Fernando Valley all the way to Long Beach. All right, and it's hooked up to 1,600 miles of storm sewers. And it was built after a great flood in 1938. And we decided that we would essentially use imported water, not local water. Now, the only problem is there's only one thing in California that's more valuable than water. What's that? Right, real estate, okay. So in 1938, everything south of downtown LA for three miles on both sides of the river flooded. So that's why they concreted the river. Now since then, there's been a lot of construction, there's been more storm sewers. So I'm actually doing a study on that right now. The question is, can you actually take some of the concrete out of the LA River without flooding LA? Or, or has all the growth that has happened since 19, the 1940s and 50s, all right, does that preclude taking concrete? Because it is a flood control channel. And the answer at this point is that don't touch the concrete in the LA River, all right? Otherwise, everything, you know, on both sides of the 110 south of downtown LA is going to flood. It's not a good, not a good answer. Now, there, we could build catchment bases on both sides of the river. We could make the river more attractive. But we sort of made an irreversible decision when we concreted those rivers. Oh, the friends of the river, they hate me, you know. <laughs> you know. Plus, you know, I just get right down to it. 95% of the time, there's no water in that river. So don't call it a river. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, I'm rooting for that PDO shift like you are, but let's just say worst case scenario, um, what's your prediction for when we'll get into have to have forced mandatory rationing if this PDO doesn't happen? Well, that's going to happen anyhow because there's just too many of us, and there's too much growth in the economy and various sectors of the economy, all right? We've reached the point where the old system doesn't work, so we need a new system, all right? And so, you know, we're going to have to rethink, for instance, water laws in California. Who owns the water? What's the equitable distribution? You know, what kind of landscaping will be legal in Southern California, you know, the people in Rancho Santa Fe have four acres and, you know, you might be using 160 gallons per day per person, but they're using 480, you know, that's definitely should be illegal, you know. 
Montecino, the same thing, you know. Beverly Hills, you know, Westwood, you know. Poor people don't use water. Rich people abuse water, all right? It's not fair. So we kind of have to come up with a fairer system, all right? In addition to legal and political questions, I mean, we've heard 10 ideas of innovation, potential innovation. Uh, I remember Dean Kamen was on the TV this uh, winter showing some little water purification gadget that could be uh, used in Africa. So it seems to me we haven't really talked about venture capital. And basically, California probably has the biggest concentration of venture capital in the world. So I don't know whether you or anybody in the audience knows whether venture capital skills are being applied and maybe pricing of water alongside the political and the legal conflict. I agree with you 100%. This is an opportunity, all right, because this is a, we're so dependent on the water here. This is definitely an opportunity for new ideas, new technology, better water efficiency. And so, you know, young people better get on the stick here and start taking advantage of this opportunity. You know, that's what made California such a great place. New ideas, new technologies. And so I'm pretty optimistic, actually, that we can get out of this whole thing. But we're definitely going to fundamentally have to change our lifestyles. And, you know, this has been going on a long time here, but uh, let me make one final thing. This is America. What's the most important thing you do in America, all right? It's not letting the, you know, letting, it, letting the yellow mellow in your toilet, all right? That doesn't change the world. It helps a little bit. But the most important thing that you do is vote, all right? And right now, the political power in this state is with agriculture, all right? and with the water barons. And so if you want the situation to change, you want the water laws to change, you want the water allocation, all right? You want how, what kind of energy we use to run this state, whether it's gonna be renewable energy or coal or gas, all right? How you do that is who you vote for, all right? So, you know, taking showers together is good, you know? Driving a Prius is good, yeah? Planting a tree is super, all right? But the most important thing you do is how you vote and who you vote for. And I'm, I'm, I'm running. I'm running for water zone. <laughs> Good.